Well, you know by now that we live in a world that is asking a lot of questions when it comes to Jesus. Let me ask you a question today. Do you believe that God is real? Do you believe that Jesus is the one who saves? Do you believe that the Bible that you read is the word of God? Why do you believe those things? And how are you going to prove to somebody who doesn't believe that what you believe is truth? Today, we're kicking off a series of messages that I'm calling Questioning Christianity. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people who think differently than you think. There are a lot of people who believe different things than you believe. And there are skeptics that see the world very differently than you and I see the world. And yet, when you read the Word of God, it tells us clearly that we have been called to love these people and to share with them the hope that we have, but we're also called to defend our faith and have a reason for the faith that we have. In 1 Peter 3.15, we are told to be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So God tells us, don't just say you believe something, but know why you believe and also be ready at any time and at all times to give a defense for the belief that you have. For the next several weeks, we're going to be addressing some difficult questions regarding the Christian faith. And my prayer is that as we dive into the Bible, that many of us will become even better equipped when it comes to not only what we believe, but why we believe it. Today, we're going to begin this journey by unpacking one of the primary problems that many skeptics have with the Christian faith. You know, skeptics have a hard time believing that Jesus is the only way to God. And when we say Jesus is the only way, or Jesus alone can save, or Jesus can forgive sins, or Jesus is the way to heaven, there are a lot of people that say, that's why I'm not going to become a Christian Because it's narrow-minded to believe that Jesus is the only way. And not only skeptics believe that, by the way, there are a lot of people in the church, apparently, who also have a hard time understanding and believing that Jesus alone can save. In fact, I recently read an article in the Christian Post of all magazines, and this is what it said. Over 60% of self-described born-again Christians in America, he's talking about us, do not believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that Buddha and Muhammad are also valid paths to salvation. Now, I don't know who they were polling when they wrote this article. But I thought to myself, if that is accurate information about the church in America today, then mark my words, the church in America is in big trouble. Amen? If we don't believe that Jesus alone can save, if we don't believe that Jesus is the only way, and we're starting to believe this nonsense, we are in trouble as the church. The year that I graduated high school, I heard the great theologian Madonna say something very different or very similar to this. I can remember she was talking about God and her faith, and as she was speaking on MTV, she said this statement, always lead to God. And she said it a second time, always lead to God. She was essentially saying, it doesn't really matter what you believe. As long as you believe something, you're going to get to God. As long as you believe something, you're going to get to heaven. And there are a lot of people walking on the face of the earth today that have a similar viewpoint to Madonna. We see heaven as if it's any other destination. We see it like it's a place on the map. And we, we compare it to other destinations that we know, say, say Atlanta. And we know that there are a lot of different ways that you can go and arrive at Atlanta. If you're trying to get to Atlanta, we know that you can take I-75 South or you can take I-75 North and you're going to get there. And you know that you're there because you're going to hit a wall of traffic that you're going to be stuck in for an hour before you get to where you're trying to go. Can I get an amen from somebody who's been in that traffic, right? But we also know you can get to Atlanta from other places. You can get there from I-20 from the east or the west, or you can get there from I-85 coming up from Alabama. You can get there by traveling the back roads, or you can take the scenic route, or you can get there by bus or train or plane. You can walk there, jog there, run there. You, You can even ride a horse there if you want to. There are a lot of different ways that you can arrive at your destination called Atlanta. And once you're there, You're there. 
Now, I have no idea why I'm comparing Atlanta to heaven. Those two places couldn't be any more different than one another. But hear me when I say this, if you want to get to heaven, anybody want to get to heaven today, raise your hand. If you want to get to heaven, there's only one way to get there and it's through the person of Jesus Christ, period. One way. Listen, God didn't give us a roadmap and give us multiple routes and paths that we can take to get to that destination. He didn't give us a lot of different options to choose from. He said, if you want to get there, it comes through Jesus. In fact, in John 3, 17, it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Did you hear me? Through him and him alone. Jesus alone can save us. Jesus alone can get us to the destination called eternal life in heaven. Listen, other world religions have a way different perspective when it comes to how we arrive at heaven. In fact, I wanted to give you a list of some different religions around the world so you can kind of get an understanding of what they believe. You've got Hinduism and you have Buddhism and you have Baha'i and what they believe is that works and wisdom will lead to ultimate fulfillment. And then you go down the list to Zoroastrianism or Islam, and they believe in a works-based salvation. They believe if we're good enough here on on earth, that we're going to experience something better when we die. Or, Or you've got Scientology, and believe it or not, Scientology doesn't really believe in an afterlife. They believe when you die, your soul is then born again into another human body. Or you have Unitarianism or you have Wicca and they believe the afterlife is what you make of it. So you want to have a great afterlife? Then man, just make it awesome. Or then you have these atheism or Shintoism or Taoism or Confucianism. And they believe there is no life after death. They simply believe heaven doesn't exist. But you and I well know that Christianity does believe in eternity. Eternity is real, and there's only one way to experience it. We believe that heaven is real, but there's only one way to get in. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is the door. You wanna get into heaven, let me say it again. Jesus is the door. You've gotta walk through the door if you wanna arrive at heaven. You know what I love about the Bible? I love the fact that the Bible is consistent And it's been abundantly clear since the very beginning of time. In fact, you can go to the very first book in your Bible, all the way back to the book of Genesis. And I was reminded this week of a story in that book about Noah and the ark. And you know this story. The Bible says that Noah found favor with God. And God chose to save Noah and to save his family. And they all survived the flood. What you may not realize is that the ark in this story was an Old Testament picture of Jesus. Noah's family entered the ark and they were saved. And how did they enter the ark? Well, they entered through a single door. There was one door that led into that ark and all who were saved entered through that one single door. When it says that Noah found favor with God, I find it interesting that that word favor in the original language is also where we get our English word grace. So you can read it like this, Noah found grace with God. He and his family were saved by grace, just like you and I are saved by grace. By grace, God provided a door to salvation. And you know what the Lord tells us about that door? All throughout the scriptures, the Lord tells us that the door to salvation is narrow. The door to salvation is narrow. It always has been. There are a lot of people who think they're saved on planet earth, and yet they haven't walked through that door. There are a lot of people who who think they're saved right now in churches across America, and yet they're walking on the wide path and not the narrow path. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, Verse 13, he said, even enter through the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. See, the Bible says that Jesus alone is that narrow gate for salvation. And when the church says that Jesus is the gate, when they say that Jesus is that narrow path, that's when the world says, no, it has to be more than just Jesus. 
See, the skeptic has always said it's narrow-minded to believe that Jesus is the only way. Certainly, there are other ways to get to God. They say it's narrow-minded to believe that Jesus alone can save me, and yet that's what the gospel tells us. But when the skeptic says it's narrow-minded to believe these things, you know how I typically respond? I respond by saying, you're exactly right. I agree with you. It is narrow-minded to believe these things. But you know what? Just because Christianity is narrow doesn't make it untrue. Amen? Just because it's narrow doesn't make it untrue. In fact, when you think about it, get this. All truth is narrow-minded. All truth is narrow-minded. Let me give you an example of that. When I tell you that two plus two equals four, am I telling you the truth or not? You see, when I say two plus two equals four, there could be someone that says, hey, that's pretty narrow-minded of you to believe that. Why can't two plus two equals three? Why can't it equal five? Well, let me tell you why. The reason two plus two can't equal three or five is because it's four. You say, well, Jordan, that's pretty narrow-minded of you to say that. But guess what? It is narrow-minded, but it's also true. You can say two plus two equals five all day long and be open-minded about your answer, but you can be open-minded and you'll still be wrong. You get it? See, I would rather be narrow-minded and believe the truth than be open-minded and to be convinced of a lie. All truth is narrow. Now, Madonna says, always lead to God. That's open-minded, but it's also untrue. Jesus said, I am the only way to God, which is very narrow-minded, but it's also true. So the question I wanna ask you as we get kicked off today is this, are you going to believe Jesus or are you gonna believe Madonna? All right, let me give you two simple reasons why you can believe Jesus today. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, get this in in your notes. Number one, Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. This is the first reason that you can believe him today. Because he himself made the claim that he was the path to salvation. In John 14, 6, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father from now on. You do know him and have seen him. Those are some big claims from the mouth of Jesus, especially in the context of the day. He's sitting there and he's talking to people who know a lot about God. And he's saying, if you know me, you know him. He claimed to be the son of God. When you think about the things that Jesus said of himself, it's pretty impressive when you put it all together. He said things like, I am the first and I am the last, the self-existent one. He said, do you need your sins to be forgiven? Guess what? I can do that. Do you you know how to live? Well, just follow me. He said, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I mean, can you imagine Jesus saying these things about himself? He, He said, all authority has been given to me. Not some authority, but all authority. Do you have worries? Do you have requests? He said, then pray in my name. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be given to you. He said, do you need access to God the Father? Well, guess what? No one comes to the Father except through me. When Jesus made all of the claims that he made, you have to understand, he was either 100% right or he was 100% wrong. If Jesus was only 1% wrong in his claim to be the only way to God, guess what? We're all in trouble today. Because if Jesus was only 99% God, you and I are 100% lost. He was either 100% right or he was 100% wrong. Hey, but thankfully, we can, we can be sure today that Jesus wasn't wrong. Amen? We are good today because God is good and because Jesus himself is God. You see, Jesus claimed to be the only way to God. But the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus backed up that claim. Jesus backed up his claim to be the only way to God. In John chapter 10, verse 30, these are the words of Jesus. He said, I and the Father are one. And I share that verse with you today because the only way that Jesus can be the only way, the only way he could be the single door that allows people like us to get to God 
is if Jesus himself was God. That's the only way that Jesus can be the only way. So get this in your notes today. Jesus isn't just the only way to God. Jesus himself is God. He is God. And he has backed up that claim since the very beginning of time. You say, well, how has Jesus backed up that claim since the very beginning of time? Well, I'm going to show you five ways before we end our time together today. The first thing I want you to jot down is this. The Old Testament predicted it. Going all the way back to the Old Testament, Jesus proves that he is who he says he is. The Old Testament predicted that going all the way back to the prophet Isaiah. You see, in Isaiah 52, it talks about the Messiah long before the Messiah came and long before the Messiah was crucified. And this is what Isaiah says in chapter 52. He said, my servant will be successful. He will be raised and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were appalled at you, his appearance was so disfigured that he did not look like a man and his form did not resemble a human being. If you go on to the next chapter, Isaiah 53, Isaiah continues to talk about the coming Messiah. He says he is despised and he is rejected by mankind. He says he bore our sickness, he carried our pain, he was struck down by God and he was afflicted. It says that he was pierced by our rebellion. He was crushed because of our iniquities. He says punishment for our peace was on him and we are healed by his wounds. Now, when you read that text in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, who does it sound like he's talking about there? He's talking about Jesus, right? Well, the interesting thing about that is this passage was written 700 years before Jesus was even born. It was written about the coming Messiah, and he writes in detail specific things about the life of Christ. You may not realize this, but Jesus wasn't the only man claiming to be the son of God in the first century. Did you know that? You know, many scholars will tell you that Jesus was one of about 40 Jewish men in the first century that claimed to be the Messiah. He's walking around the Galilee claiming to be the son of God. And one scholar said that up to eight other men were also circling the Galilee at the same time of Christ, making the exact same claims that he was making. So I guess the question that we've got to ask today, and really the question that you and I have to be able to answer is this. How do we really know that Jesus of Nazareth is truly the promised Messiah? How do you know? Well, let me show you one key reason that we know that Jesus is who he says he is. In the Old Testament, there are hundreds of messianic prophecies that describe specific details about the coming Messiah. And you look through your Old Testament and what you'll see is messianic prophecy after messianic prophecy looking forward to the coming Christ. I wanna share just a couple of those messianic prophecies with you so you can see how specific they really are. You can see on this side, this is where the Messianic prophecy was written in the Old Testament. And over here, this is where they were fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus fulfilled them. Like for instance, the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Well, I don't know about those other eight guys walking around the Galilee, but something tells me that none of them were born of a virgin. Very few people you know were born of virgins. You know that, right? This is a rare thing. But Jesus actually fulfilled that in Luke chapter one, verse 31. Other messianic prophecies, the Messiah would be pierced, talking about at the crucifixion. The Messiah would come riding on a donkey. The Messiah would be betrayed by a friend. There's another messianic prophecy that said he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. The Messiah would perform signs of healing. The Messiah would be resurrected from the dead. That's another tough one for a human being to accomplish. There are literally hundreds of messianic prophecies in your Old Testament that speak specifically about the coming Messiah. And mark this down, Jesus is the only one in history to fulfill each one. The famous mathematician Peter Stoner actually predicted the probability of one person fulfilling just 48 of the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. And what he calculated was that for a person like us to accomplish 48, our chances would be one in 10 to the 157th power. 
Now, I asked the question, what does 10 to the 157th power look like? That's what it looks like. It's a 10 with 157 zeros following. Now, your chances of fulfilling 48 of the prophecies is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Now, I show that to you, and Peter Stoner calculated that to basically show that it is mathematically impossible for one person to fulfill just 48 of these prophecies. It's impossible. And therefore, it's never been accomplished by any natural human being ever. But what we know about Jesus is that he didn't just complete 48 of these prophecies. He accomplished all of them. He accomplished all 400 plus messianic prophecies, which shows us that he's not some natural man, but rather he is supernaturally God in the flesh. What makes Jesus different? And what makes Jesus the way? I think this one fact says everything that needs to be said. The Old Testament predicted it. But let me give you another reason to write down today. The New Testament proclaimed it. Where the Old Testament predicted it, the New Testament proclaimed it. In John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Now, who is the Word? That's Jesus. And the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him and apart from him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In him was life and that life was the light of man. In Mark chapter 14, verse 61, it says the high priest questioned Jesus and said, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And look at how he responded. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. When Jesus used that phrase and he said, I am, he was quoting the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. He in that moment declared himself to be the self-existent one. And for that reason, the New Testament never portrays Jesus to be a son of God. It never portrays him to be a man who became God or even a great teacher who was used by God. No, when you read the New Testament, It makes it abundantly clear that Jesus is the son of God. He is God in the flesh. He is Emmanuel, God with us. So your Old Testament predicts it. Your New Testament proclaims it. But let me give you one more way that we can know that Jesus is who he says he is. Are you ready? Say yes. Yes. All right, number three, here we go. The demons pronounced it. The demons. You say, Jordan, are you really going to talk about the demons and try to prove that Jesus is who he says he is through the demons? Absolutely, I am. Why else would God tell us about the demons if it wasn't to point us to Jesus? When you go to the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 5, Jesus confronted a man who was living in a graveyard. Do you remember the story? This man had an unclean spirit within him. And the Bible describes this man as being out of control. You can use your imagination and just picture this man. In fact, the Bible says it this way. It says, no one was able to restrain him, not even with a chain. This was a big guy that was being controlled by an unclean spirit. And yet Mark chapter five, verse six, it says this. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him. And he cried out with a loud voice. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you before God, don't torment me. That's fascinating to me. A demon is talking to Jesus. In fact, there's another story I want you to look at. Just flip one page to the left to Mark chapter one. In that passage, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum, a place where he called home for a couple of years right there on the Galilee. And there was another man that day that had an unclean spirit within him. And verse 24 tells us that that in that moment, the demons within this man cried out and they're speaking to Jesus once again. This is what it says in verse 24. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Do you know anybody in your world that says that Jesus isn't isn't God? Have you ever met somebody that says, you know what, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe that he's the son of God. I don't believe he has authority. I don't believe he's this or I don't believe he's that. I've met a lot of people like that. 
And let me just tell you, people throughout history have doubted the deity of Jesus, but there's never been a doubt in the minds of the demons. Isn't that fascinating? People can doubt Jesus, but demons never did. They knew who he was from the very beginning and they have always submitted to his authority as God. The Old Testament predicted it. The New Testament proclaimed it. The demons pronounced it. And the fourth reason is the miracles personified it. The miracles of Jesus personified it. In John chapter 10, some religious Jews gathered around Jesus and they asked him straight up. They said, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? And I find it fascinating how he responded in that conversation. When they asked him, are you the Christ? He points back to the miracles that he has done. And he says, of course I am, and this will prove it. In fact, let me read that verse. In John chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus told these people, I did tell you and you didn't believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify about me. He said, man, everything I'm doing, it testifies about who I am. You see, it's one thing to claim to be God. It's another thing to prove that you are God. And one way that Jesus proves his deity is by performing miracles that could only be performed supernaturally. See, Jesus launched his ministry with a series of miracles. And you and I have read these stories since we were little kids. Jesus healed the sick and he gave sight to the blind and he fed thousands of people with a handful of food. Jesus demonstrated power over nature and he raised people from the dead. And every single one of these miracles were performed in public, in front of people. And they were designed to validate his claims to be the Messiah. So if you've ever wondered, man, how do I know that Jesus is the real deal? How do I know that, that he truly is the Messiah? How do I believe or why do I believe that Jesus alone can save and get me to heaven? Well, going all the way back to the Old Testament, it predicted it. The New Testament proclaimed it. The demons themselves pronounced it. The miracles personified it. And if you're ready for number five, I want you to say amen. amen. This is where it gets really exciting, guys. This is my favorite point of the whole message. Are you ready? Last but not least, the resurrection proved it. The resurrection proved it. Hey, this one point is something that may, it ought to make us shout a little bit. Even as Baptists, hey, you ought to get a little bit rowdy when you think about the resurrection of Jesus because this one point is what sets Jesus apart. It's what makes him different from every other man, every other woman that's ever lived on the face of the earth. It's what makes him different than any other so-called Messiah or, or so-called religious leader or denominational head. It makes him different than anybody else on planet earth. You can go down the list today. You can start with Muhammad and then you can go to Buddha and you can go to Confucius and you can go to Joseph Smith. I mean, go down the line. Can I tell you the story of their life? Here's how it goes. They were born, they lived, they died, they stayed dead. That's how it works. And today you and I can get on a plane and we can take a trip and we can visit their graves and we can see their bones and we can hear the stories of the impact they made while they were here. But can I tell you something? Jesus was born. He was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died a brutal death in my place and in your place, a death that he didn't deserve. But on the third day, guess what guys? He rose from the grave and he's alive today. We can get on that same plane and we can go to his grave. And let me just tell you something. He is not here for he has risen. He has risen indeed. Jesus is alive today. And Jesus is still changing lives today. The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe it with your whole heart or not? See, from the very beginning, people have either accepted the truth of Jesus or they've rejected the truth of Jesus. It's nothing new. He's not a way, he's the way. It's a narrow road to follow Jesus. It's a radical claim to say that Jesus is the only way. And yet this salvation that seems super exclusive is actually very inclusive. When you look at what's written in Romans 10, 13, it says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I did a word study. You know what this word everyone means in the original Greek? It means everyone, y'all. That includes you. 
That includes me. That includes all who believe. Listen, you can accept the truth today. You can accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. You can accept him as the the way, the truth, and the life. You can know God, but you have to realize that it's not one of many paths, he is the path. The question I have for you is this, when you realize that the road to salvation is narrow and it only goes through Jesus, are you willing to reject the wide road and choose the narrow road? Are you willing to to do away with the other doors and to walk through the single narrow door that leads to salvation? There are a lot of people who want to know Christ and they want to be saved and they want to be assured that when they die, they go to heaven, but they never get to the place in their life where Jesus is enough. It's always Jesus plus something else. And and we have a hard time embracing this idea that it is Jesus alone. Jesus alone can save. 